Hello, thank you for joining me. In the previous three programs in this series, we've examined how the relative intensities of the partials of the harmonic series determine our perception of the different timbres or tone colours of musical instruments, and how the frequency ratios formed by certain pairs of partials correspond to musical intervals. And we've traced how increasingly complex ratios and their corresponding intervals have become more and more acceptable over time. In this program, we begin a similar survey in relation to rhythm, meter and tempo. To explain this, let's begin with relatively recent events. In 1957, the German composer Karl-Heinz Stockhausen wrote an article for the new music journal Die Rehe, entitled How Time Passes. Before him, the American composer and theorist Henry Cowell had produced his book New Musical Resources, which we will refer to later. And even before him, Johannes Brahms is reported to have demonstrated an awareness of the unity that exists between metrical structures and those underlying tonality. The phenomenon they were all discussing in their individual ways is widely known as the pitch-rhythm continuum. In his article, Stockhausen relates that if you were to root the output of an oscillator producing a sine tone and lower its frequency to less than 20 Hz, then the sound would disappear because it would be below the human audio range. Now this varies between individuals and according to age, but generally it's between 20 and 20,000 Hz. In fact, Stockhausen claimed that you would hear a series of clicks once the frequency was below the audio threshold. These would probably have been caused by movements of the loudspeaker cone, but it's useful to keep this idea of clicks because it helps clarify certain aspects of the discussion that's to follow. For example, if a signal's frequency was 16 Hz, then we would hear 16 of these hypothetical clicks per second. They could be represented in musical notation like this. At the tempo of 60 quarter notes per minute, there would be one quarter note per second, which means there would be 16 64th notes as indicated here. Reducing the frequency further to the point where there was one cycle every two seconds, 0 0.5 hertz, would create a series of impulses that could be notated like this. Now, if we were to imagine using not a sine tone, but a slightly more complex one consisting of the first four partials of the harmonic series, with the half note representing the fundamental, we would hear not a series of regular clicks, but a rhythmic pattern, because each of the four partials would be making its own clicks in whole number ratio to those of the fundamental. In this case, one to two to three to four. Let's hear this starting with the fundamental and then adding the partials. From this it's clear that the ratios of the harmonic series at frequencies below the audio range correspond to definite rhythmic patterns, and it follows that when these rhythms are presented at speeds above the audio threshold, the result is pitch plus timbre.
As we saw in the second programme of this series, the plain chant of medieval monastic music, which is generally accepted as the origin of Western classical music, featured melismatic modal melodies in unmeasured rhythm. The absence of any audible or even implied pulse lent it its meditative, prayer-like quality. And as was noted in the third video, plain chant eventually developed into organum by the addition of parallel upper parts, first at the intervals of the octave, and then of the perfect fifth, and then the perfect fourth, representing the frequency ratios 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 to 4. The performance of organum would inevitably have involved some degree of coordination, possibly to ensure that the voices did indeed proceed in parallel, and perhaps herein lie the seeds of metre. Early signs of this are apparent in the florid organum, typified by the Notre Dame school of composers, the best known representatives being Léonin and Perrotin. Typically, florid organum consisted of a sustained part that utilised the notes of an established chant, cantus firmus or vox originalis, with values held for so long as to render the original chant unrecognisable. This part, called the tenor, was combined with one or more faster moving parts based on religious texts or, as time went on, on secular poetry. The number of such parts increased over time and became known as the duplum, triplum, or quadruplum. Their rhythm was dictated by that of the text. The strong or weak syllabic patterns of poetry became the long or short durations of the upper parts. Iambic and trochaic rhythm can be represented in modern musical notation like this. These poetic rhythms gave rise to the first and second rhythmic modes, of which six are generally recognised. All display correspondences to the rhythms of poetry. Dactylic equates to the third mode, anapestic to the fourth, spondaic to the fifth, and tribachic to the sixth mode. Melodic movement consisting of successions or repetitions of these rhythmic modes would inevitably give rise to the feeling of a regular pulse, with each of the perceived beats being divided into three, rather like modern compounds time. This is clearly discernible in most modern renditions of Perrotin's Viderantomnes, for example. V This emerging unit of pulse eventually became known as the tempus. During the Middle Ages it was most often divided into three, and out of reverence for the Holy Trinity, given the name tempus perfectum. While this symbolism as well as the rhythm of texts undoubtedly played their part in the development of the rhythmic modes, we can make another important observation. Let's revisit the composite rhythm we derived from the first four partials of the harmonic series at sub-audio frequencies. In the following example, time values are doubled in keeping with our previous notations of the modes, but the rhythmic relationships remain the same. Close inspection reveals that parts of this rhythm also correspond to no less than five of the medieval rhythmic modes. 
also in addition to the poetic and religious factors that guided the evolution of rhythm and meter, there was possibly a third factor, an intuitive awareness of the rhythmic relationships that seemed most natural. As is the case with harmony and tonality, the relationships that embody the frequency ratios of the most audible partials of the harmonic series. While during the Middle Ages the division of the tempus into three was the norm, by the time of the Ars Nova its division into two had become more common. Between the 15th and 17th centuries a new time division, the bar or the measure, was established. This firmly embedded the concept of meter in music, with two basic types emerging, simple, in which each beat of the bar is divided into two, and compound, where the beats are divided into three. And after this, music tended to be based on simple or compound meter for extended sections or for whole movements. This remained the model until the late classical and early romantic eras, although the vertical or horizontal interplay of compound and simple meters often took place by way of hemiola. Relationships similar to those of the frequency ratios in the harmonic series can also be observed in relation to tempo. If we look at any metronome, we see a range of standard tempo markings displayed in beats per minute. We might wonder why there are tempo markings of 72 and 76 beats per minute, but not 74 or 75. The reasons can be traced back to the fact that tempi 2 are organised in ratios similar to those applicable to harmony and to rhythm. For example, 60 beats per minute is always to be found, as is 120. It hardly needs pointing out that these are in the ratio 1 to 2, the ratio of the octave and of the half note to the quarter note. However, the ratio 1 to 2 can be discerned across a range of tempi, as can the ratios 2 to 3 and 3 to 4. Here are the lowest tempo markings up to 78 beats per minute. Let's multiply them by 2. Now by 3. And now let's multiply them by 4. Placing all these in order while eliminating duplicates results in the range of standard metronome markings. The ratios that exist between conventional tempi give rise to the concept of tempo modulation. One example is where a quarter note in one tempo becomes equal to a half note in a new tempo. This change in the ratio 2 to 1 leads to a doubling of the speed of the music. Of course, other relationships are possible. For example, if a triplet eighth note in one tempo is made to equal an eighth note in the next tempo, in other words where the ratio is 3 to 2, then the music will speed up by 1.5 times. While composers of the Baroque, Classical and Romantic eras did not calculate tempo relationships in this way, Tempo changes that embody the ratios we've just discussed feel entirely natural. For example, when moving between the slow introduction and the main body of the first movement of a Baroque or Classical Concerto, a sonata, or an overture, listen to this short extract from Mozart's Overture to the Magic Flute.
Here we take the slow introduction, the adagio at 56 beats per minute, and then the allegro section at 168 beats per minute, which sounds fairly typical of performances of this piece. Looking closely at these tempi, we find their ratio to be 1 to 3. 1 to 3, as we've seen, is the ratio of a compound perfect fifth in the domain of pitch, and of the half note, or minim, to the triplet quarter note in rhythm. Many 20th century composers, one of the most notable being Eliot Carter, consciously and deliberately made extensive use of increasingly complex tempo modulations. In Carter's case, they are more often expressed as metric modulations, but the effect in terms of perceived change of tempo is the same. So we see the same ratios of the harmonic series in play as a unifying factor in all elements of music, from the timbres of the instruments we deploy through harmony and rhythm to tempo. In the next program, we'll discuss more recent rhythmic developments in this light. So I hope you found that interesting and I hope you found it useful. If you have, please do give it a like, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next program and share it with anyone who you feel may be interested. Thank you very much again for joining me, and I very much hope that you will join me again.